so this is something that Dan was basically just touching on. Um, seeding is an important restoration tool. So we use seed uh, to direct change in plant communities in altered, that are altered by invasions and agriculture. And we also add seed just to inhibit invasive weed competition and sta stabilize soils. So although seeding is an important restoration tool, um, success rates are often low. And success rates are often low due to climate variability and competition with invasive weeds. Um, so I, oops, ideally we want to take a system that looks like this, which in this case was, is a degraded cheatgrass monoculture, and eventually one day uh, direct the plant community more towards its native uh, state, which in this case is a native, native grassland. So it's not an easy undertaking. Um, in order to survive in these harsh environments into an adult state, uh, plants must first be able to establish as seedlings. So uh, the seedling stage is an important part of the demography of a plant, but seedling ecology is really an under, underexplored area. Um, so Jeremy James and others found that the major bottleneck to plant recruitment was at the emergent stage. So they looked at the probability from um, from a, uh, the probability of surviving from a sown seed to an adult plant. And they found that the probability of survival from a sown seed to a germinated seedling is 0.72. And then from a germinated seedling to an emerging seedling is only 0.12. From an emerged seedling uh, to the established seedling stage 0.16. Then 0.75 to an, a juvenile seedling and 0.7 to an adult plant. So what is happening at this stage of establishment? Um, we really need to be looking at seedling ecology to understand the mechanisms of plant recruitment and also just to elucidate what's going on in our restoration successes and failures. Uh, so as I said, uh, the low success rates of seedings are often due to climate variability and also invasive plant competition. So ideally we want to be looking for seedlings with functional traits which confer advantages underneath these pressures. So those are going to be functional traits which uh, confer to faster growth rates, um, earlier germination, and rapid emergence. So these are a lot of the functional traits that we see in our invasive species. So we're looking for uh, native seedlings with these same traits to be able to compete in the face of competition and also in harsh environments in general. So research has shown that even really small differences in early growth rates, sometimes even a matter of days, can equate to large differences in an adult plant fitness. And so just an, exa an example of this, this is just a, a theoretical illustration that I put together. Um, we've got two seedlings, or two seeds that were sown at the same time, same soils, same moisture. <clears throat> so as the season progresses, these seedlings are going to be basically at a race to beat the drying fronts and get down, uh, seed, get down roots into these mo more moist areas. So as the soil profile dries, even small differences in root lengths between these two seedlings are going to equate to great advantages in the long term. And this is just even in harsh environments, and this can also equate when they're dealing with comp competitors in the fields. So our study species is Sandberg bluegrass. It's Poa secunda. It's a cool season perennial bunch grass, and it's one of the first grasses to green up in the spring. Uh, cheatgrass, as we all know, is an invasive annual grass. Um, its competitive ability lies in its, its phenology, so it's one of the, it's an early establishing grass. Um, it's able to germinate in cooler, cooler, earlier in the season in cooler conditions. Um, and the reason that we, uh, really have been looking and doing a lot of research with Sandberg's bluegrass is that it's phenologically similar to cheatgrass, which gives us the idea that it's possibly a good competitor with cheatgrass. So in the past, we've identified adult populations of Sandberg's bluegrass that are vary in their ability to compete and tolerate with cheatgrass. So in our previous experiment, we went across the ranch, and these are all local populations that were, um, that were taken from MPG. And we gathered adult populations across the ranch, we excavated them, brought them to the greenhouse, split them in half, and challenged one half with cheatgrass and one half without. So 
at the end of the experiment, the POA adults with greater amounts of leaf tissue were assumed to have a higher cheatgrass tolerance. And then we can see here that these populations that we excavated varied in their ability to tolerate cheatgrass. And another part of that study, we looked at competitive ability. So this is our uh, POA populations here and cheatgrass biomass at the end of the experiment. So the populations or individuals that were challenged with cheatgrass, the lower biomass at the end of the experiment is going to equate to a greater competitive ability. So these lower bars mean that these populations had a greater competitive ability. So we see again that these, uh, these populations vary in their competitive and uh, tolerant ability with cheatgrass. So we've demonstrated that adult and local Sandberg's populations have an ability to tolerate cheatgrass. And this has also been seen in other literature. And you can also see it in the field. It's, it's hard to see in this picture, but this is a, basically a cheatgrass monoculture. And when you dig down in these, you can see these individual, I can't even see it from here, individual poa plants that are growing in these invasions. <coughs> so we've identified that adults can, can compete, but what's happening at the seedling level? So as I said before, we want to be able to find seedlings, native seedlings, with functional traits which confer to faster growth rates, earlier germination, and rapid emergence. But on another level, we also want to if we're going to be uh, competing with cheatgrass, we also want to have these functional traits uh, be able to uh, function better and have greater, greater competitive ability in lower temperatures when they're going to be competing with cheatgrass. Um, and we also want to be able to get seed sources that are they're generally adapted to our area. So we asked the question, how does the seedling growth of accessions of Sandberg's bluegrass differ in these different temperatures. And an accession is just um, a collection of plant material from a distinct location. And then specifically, we were asked how do cultivated varieties and our local sources of Sandberg's differ in response to temperature. And a cultivated variety is just um, a plant that's been propagated for desirable growth traits. And lastly, we just wanted to see how do these different accessions of sandbergs compare to cheatgrass in these different growth temperatures. So what we, we sourced six different seed sources of sandbergs. Uh, these were from originally from Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. Um, our first one is High Plains. It's a cultivated variety of sandbergs, and it was originally sourced across Wyoming from three different, uh, three different accessions, so it's a composite of these three. Uh, next, we looked at, we also had MT1, which is a collection from Toole County, Montana, and Opportunity, which is a cultivated variety from Anaconda, Montana. Mountain Home is a cultivated variety as well. It's from near Mountain Home, Idaho. And lastly, we have our local populations that were sourced from MPG. So this is our local population 15. It's a higher elevation collection. And our local population 10, which is our lower elevation collection. So we took these uh, six different accessions and cheatgrass, and we grew them in two different temperature environments. Uh, we wanted to simulate warm and cold. and so. We did uh, two different treatments in the growth chamber. Uh, one was a warm treatment of 20 C day, 15 C night. And our cold was a 10 C day and a 5 C night with a 12 hour day and night simulation. And our seeds grew in these germination pouches, which are basically the substrate, this brown part, is basically just like a paper towel. And then it's enclosed in a clear plastic bag, which you can add nutrients and water to. And when you add the nutrients and water, it wicks up to this perforation where you can add the seed. And uh, as the seed grows through the perforation, you can see the roots and visualize growth through time. So we took these pouches and we added uh, 50 seeds of each accession and cheatgrass for both treatments, five seeds for each individual pouch, and then monitored uh, germination in the pouches every other day. And then once germination was initiated and we have root growth, we scan the pouches every other day. And when we scan them, we put them down on this face down on the scanner, and then we can get an image, which we can later analyze with WinRISO software and get an idea of root growth and root lengths. 
So after 20 days, we harvested each of the individuals, and this is what an harvested individual looks like, which is an image we can, uh, we can, we scan the image and then use the WinRISO to, to look at these root lengths of the final, final seedling. And this is just an example of what those pouches look like when you uh, take an image of them. So this is cheatgrass, five different cheatgrass seeds and growing through time. So it's just really cool to be able to visualize what's, what's going on. And these are, these are our results. So uh, first we've got the root growth rate. So this is the daily growth of each of those accessions. Um, so we've got daily growth here in centimeters and then each of our accessions on the x-axis. And these are separated by the cold and warm temperature treatments by this red line. So the first thing that we notice is that not surprisingly, cheatgrass has greater root growth both in cold and warm temperature treatments compared to our uh, sandbark successions. But secondly, see that our high plains accession has significantly higher root growth than all of our other six accessions in the cold temperature treatment. And also in the warm temperature treatment, all of our sandberg accessions tended to have really similar root growth. And this is our final root length. So this is the total root length at the end of the experiment after we harvested. Uh, this is the total root length in centimeters and then the same setup as in the last slide with cold and warm treatments separated. And again, we see that cheatgrass has a greater final root length in both the cold and warm temperatures compared to our, uh, our accessions. We see the high plains trended towards having the highest final root lengths in the cold treatment. And population 10 uh, specifically had significantly lower uh, final root length in the cold treatment than, our, than high plains. And lastly, we looked at germination timing. So this is the average number of days it takes for a seed to initiate germination in both temperature treatments. So the lower the bar, the earlier germination in that treatment. Uh, we see again that cheatgrass, not surprisingly, has um, earlier germination in the cold and warm temperature treatments. And then we also see that MT1 had significantly earlier germination timing in our, early, in our um, cold growth treatment. And High Plains had the second earliest germination timing compared to other accessions. So with this work, we, would, we identified that uh, the seedlings of High Plains and MT1 have the greatest growth traits. So in the cold treatments, they have higher root growth rates larger root lengths and earlier germination. So the trend is that high plains and MT1 performance was greater than our local population performance in these conditions. So then you might ask, well, how does this confer to the field? So uh, Molly Herget, she was, a, she was a grad student from the University of Wyoming. She did her thesis research field portion at MPG Ranch last year. And she looked at some of the same accessions that we did of Sandbergs and also the same local populations that we had. So she took these as seed, planted them in the field, and then she challenged them with and without cheatgrass competition. And then this is just a, a mean proportion of survivorship at the end of that experiment. So here we've got mean proportion of survivors. Uh, the white bars are just the control with no cheat competition in black is with cheat competition. And these are our two locals and high plains and mountain home. And this is a cultivar that reliable that we didn't use in our seedling growth study. So what she found was that at the end of the experiments, high plains had significantly greater mean proportion of survivors with and without competition. So it had a superior ability to establish. And not to mention that these sites last year was a specifically um, it was a warm summer, so these are really harsh, harsh environment that these were establishing in. Um, and then we also see that our local populations, again, had, had um, lower survivorship in these, in these plots. So our, uh, our seedling study and the field study reveal the same pattern. So our high plains uh, had greater, greater growth than our local POP 10, and then our local POP, our local POP 15, and then our local pop, population 10. So we were looking at these different seed sources and we were wondering, you know, how do these differ from each other? So originally they're all sourced from different areas with different climates. 
So I wanted to see how those related to some of the growth traits that we look at. Uh, so I, I gathered PRISM data from the last 30 years from the historical source sites, and then I uh, compared that to our germination characteristics, so, or our, um, our growth characteristics. So here we've got the average minimum winter temperatures of source area over the last 30 years, and that uh, compared to the average number of days to germination, and we found a strong relationship between the two. So these are, our, are each of our different source sites. So the, the relationship being that the earlier germinants are also sourced from areas with colder, lower winter climates. And then the same pattern we saw here when looking at uh, the total root length. Uh, so again, we see that the seed sources with the longest total root length at the end of the experiment in cold treatment were also sourced from areas with lower minimum winter temperatures. And this is just to give you an idea of what those minimum and maximum temperatures are at certain times of the year. So this is the average, or this is the early spring temperatures. So this is an, a time when Poa secunda is going to be germinating and starting to establish in the field. And these are our different source areas. Um, I've separated High Plains 3 and 1 and 2 because High Plains 3 is from uh, a higher elevation area and tends to be a little bit colder than higher plains one, High Plains 1 and 2. Um, so, and this is our minimum temperatures in the early spring, maximum, and then just the average of the two. So we see here again that our, uh, our, seedling, our seed sources with greater functional traits in cold conditions are also sourced from these cold climates. But then you might ask yourself, how will these do in harsh conditions when the summer comes around? Are they going to be able to establish and persist? Well, so I also looked at so one of the harshest times of the year, uh, for these, for uh, Sandbergs, and that's going to be around late spring, early summer, when the plant's starting to senesce and put its energy into fruiting and seeding. And then looking at these minimum and maximum and average temperatures in this time period, we see that there's really not a lot of variation in these historical, historical climates. So, We've seen that our Sandberg successions do respond differently to temperature. Uh, specifically, High Plains and MT1 have the greatest seedling growth traits, and our local accessions have the least competitive growth traits. Um, we've also seen that our seedling study elucidates some of the mechanisms of Molly's field study. So looking at seedling ecology can be a major research aid into understanding plant recruitment mechanisms, and also understanding our restoration successes and failures. And lastly, our greatest performers were from the coldest climate. So we may be able to look at climate data in the future and use that as an aid in choosing plant materials, which are better adapted for our current and modified systems. So with that, I just want to thank Molly and Kelly and the Orchard House people for keeping all those pouches wet and then Prairie for all those beautiful POA pictures. <laughs> and that's it. Does anyone have any questions?